Hello, good morning, welcome. It's so great to see you all, and suddenly the lights have gone down, so I can't quite see you, but I'm, I'm Pam Franks. I am the class of 1956 director of the Williams College Museum of Art, and I am just delighted to say welcome this morning. I really uh, couldn't resist uh, jumping up here for just a minute to say hello, welcome, and thank you as we embark on this uh, extraordinary series of discussions today. The symposium, Women Shaping Space, Feminism and Materiality, uh, is part of the programming that is going along with the extraordinary exhibition over at the Williams College Museum of Art that I hope you all have had uh, many chances to spend time with and we'll have more today and around your time here. Marianne Unger, To Shape a Moon from Bone. It has been such a privilege and an inspiration to have this exhibition. So before I turn the microphone over to my colleague, Lisa Doran, Deputy Director for Curatorial Engagement at WICMA, I just wanna say a few thank yous. Um, Horace Ballard for his remarkable scholarship, passion for the project, landmark publication and curating the exhibition. Horace, thank you for your friendship to WICMA. Um, we just are so grateful for the ongoing relationship with you now that you have um, moved on to Harvard but stay engaged with Williams. Thank you. Big, big thank you to the Marianne Unger Estate and especially Allison Kaufman, Marianne's family, and especially fellow artists Eve Biddle and Jeffrey Biddle, the team at the Davidson Gallery for the shared commitment to this artist and the thought partnership that was essential to bringing this multifaceted exhibition together. We have some extraordinary lenders to the exhibition, the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Munson Williams Proctor Museum. Of course, the entire WICMA team has been integral to making this project such a success and I'm deeply grateful. Very glad to be here at the 62 Center. Thank you to our friends here for the use of this space. I do wanna say that it is always um, so moving to me to see the and to experience the grace with which our colleagues here at the 62 Center um, present such a beautiful land acknowledgement and I, I wanna say thank you for that as well. Um, and thank you to all of you for being with us here today on this beautiful autumn day. So thank you for letting me jump on the stage for a minute to say all those thank yous um, to all of you. I'm delighted to be here, so excited about the conversations that are coming up and to hear more about the program and today's speakers, let me turn it over to Lisa now. Thanks Pam and again, thank you all for being here and um, I, I just want to, to say we had a, a, an incredible start to this event last night with Heather Hart's incredible talk, and we thank you, Heather, for starting us off on such an amazing note. Uh, today, throughout the day, we're going to have some really fantastic conversations, and there's some uh, wonderful people who are, are joining us today, and uh, I want to point everybody to your programs where the uh, the bios for all of our speakers are listed there. We won't be introducing speakers with their full bios um, throughout the day just to to keep things moving and have um, you know be able to stick to to the the amazing conversations that everyone's going to have. Um, so if you want to learn more about our speakers, please look at the uh, the program that you had um, that you were able to pick up on your way in. Um, we are so excited about these conversations, and as I, I mentioned last night, um, you know, this was a, a dream team uh, collaboration uh, to kind of uh, think about what it was that we wanted to talk about uh, together in this moment um, with Marianne Unger as the sort of jumping off point as, as a launching pad for discussions that um, are really uh, focused on, you know, artists, women artists, sculpture, um, thinking about um, how how these artists are making space and um, you know for for themselves for their art and for us 
Um, we want to acknowledge, too, that there is um, simultaneously in, uh, in Venice, Italy, a, 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 an, an amazing um, confluence of conversations that, uh, that are, are um, happening on, uh, through the project of Simone Lee, the artist Simone Lee, uh, called Loop, Loop, Loophole of Retreat, Venice. And so a, a huge uh, uh, you know, event with, um, with incredible colleagues artists, activists, scholars, who are all coming together uh, to, to, to dialogue and, um, and to think about um, work centered on black women's intellectual and creative la labor. So we are um, kind of in synergy with them today and thinking about them as they um, have their discussions and we have our discussions. So we're grateful again for everybody for being here and for all of the incredible participants. Um, so at this point, I am going to um, turn the podium over to our, our first speaker. Um, we're, we're just delighted um, uh, to, to have Alison Kaufman, the director of the Marianne Unger Estate, uh, kind of start us off today with a discussion of Marianne's work. So thank you so much, Alison. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're just really glad to be here and to be able to talk about Marianne Unger's work and the incredible exhibition that's on view here at WICMA. My name is Allison Kaufman, and I'm the founding director of the Marianne Unger Estate. I never had the chance to meet Marianne Unger, and I hadn't heard of her when I took this job in 2007. And I never in a million years thought that I would still be here working on this endeavor 15 years later. But I'm excited to be here today telling you about what I've come to know about Marianne and her work, how the estate has grown, and um, why I'm thrilled to be here giving this introduction. As is the case with most of the staff at the Marianne Unger Estate and Jeffrey Biddle Studio, which works with the photography of Marianne's husband, Jeffrey Biddle, I'm an artist. And in my practice, I work with video, photography, and installation, and investigate societal performances addressing issues of gender, aspiration, vulnerability, and consumerism in the public and private spheres. And I play on the performance and gaze inherent in all video and photography. Some of my projects include a video titled Dancing with Divorced Men, which I, um, in which I dance with divorced middle-aged men in their homes, which I was inspired to do based on my own parents' divorce and my own relationship with my father. And um, what I found were uh, uh, participants that were looking for hope and connection over this topic, um, along with me, which is what I was looking for. I've recorded performances of the mostly male visitors to guitar center stores and seeing their performances as self-portraits or portraits based on which part of this um, consumerist experience the, the, the store set up stages and you can play out a fantasy of being a rock star, which is something that we all feel and a fantasy that we all have. You can kind of decide if you identify with being the DJ or being the acoustic guitar person or being the, um, drummer. And um, I've also set up, alongside this piece, set up an um, installation that remakes a DJ or speaker showroom and kind of club atmosphere um, inside of uh, art galleries um, to kind of point to the ridiculousness of this kind of party happening in these consumer spaces all of the time and a Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock in the morning or a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, these empty kind of parties. Um, in these spaces. And then I have also um, filmed the once earnest and hopeful but weathered and worn pennants of used car dealerships um, in Brooklyn. So while I was getting my MFA at the School of Visual Arts, I reached out to some former colleagues to see if anybody knew of any part-time work. And a colleague wrote me back and said that she'd just gotten off the phone with a man named Jeffrey Biddle, a photographer who was now living in California, and that he was looking for someone to take his late wife's artwork out of storage in New York City and put it on view in their former live workspace in the Bowery. She th thought this could be a good match, so she put Jeffrey and I in touch, and we talked on the phone, and we hit it off, and he told me that he thought you could tell about a person right away. And he happened to be coming to New York in a few weeks, so we met in person. And he was very dedicated to and believed in Marianne's work and knew that it needed to be seen and remembered. 
So I started working for the estate on a part-time basis, just a few hours a week, as my school schedule would allow. In the beginning, and for the first several years, it was just me at the loft at 5 East 3rd Street by myself, combing through archives, CVs, loan forms for exhibitions that Marianne had been in, rummaging through her extensive journals, looking at slides and scans of the artwork and trying to get a handle on where pieces were, were they in storage, did they still exist anymore, um, were they in collections. I was trying to piece together her existence and her life and her work. I was going through old Rolodexes, reading artist statements and grant applications and proposals for shows that she curated, which some of them happened, some of them didn't. I heard stories and I got information from Jeffrey, who has an incredible memory. As video and photography were what I knew best, I wasn't terribly familiar with sculpture, but I was driven to the immediacy and the vulnerability of the work, the joy and the pain that was evident. I was drawn to the story of this capable, dedicated, and prolific maker, and to her career that was burning brightly but was cut short, sadly. I was drawn to her accomplishments and her incredible skill with a wide variety of materials. And as I slowly began to get a handle on the extensive collection of work at the estate, I took works out of storage, choosing what spoke to me and moved me the most, and what seemed most significant in her career, and I had them installed at the space. I also started to ask for help. I reached out to anybody else that I could connect with that was working on artists' estates and legacies. And taking one step at a time, I reached out to institutions that had collected Marianne's work during her lifetime, or curators that knew her people that had visited her at um, the loft on 3rd Street. And I invited them to come visit the space again, and it was clear to me when they came that the work had the type of effect on them that it had on me. So over the course of the first few years, we were able to place a few of Marianne's sculptures at institutions that already had her work or had curators that had known her, such as the Albright Knox Art Gallery and the Weatherspoon Art Museum. But for a long time still, it was mostly me, by myself, at the loft on the Bowery, on the phone with Jeffrey in California, trying to resurrect Marianne's legacy, tell her story, and hope that someday somebody would hear us. All of this work was, and still does, take place at the loft that Marianne found in 1975. Marianne and Jeffrey had met that same year as they were both researchers at the Magnum Photographic Library, and they soon began dating. Marianne was making large-scale sculpture and it couldn't fit in her apartment on Lafayette Street, so she was looking for a place where she could live and work that was big enough to hold her sculpture. She heard about an artist-in-residence building on the Bowery and 3rd Street and went about seeing if she could get a floor of this artist-in-residency building herself. In his forthcoming memoir, Rock in a Landslide, which chronicles his life with Marianne and which many of the photographs that I'll be sharing today come from, Jeffrey describes, she scored a whole floor, raw and filthy, where there had been a factory which produced infusers, perforated metal balls for making tea. She had nearly 2,000 square feet with beautiful light from windows on all four sides. It was also filled with machinery, smelled of oil, had two stalled toilets, walls that were pocked and peeling in a disintegrating floor. But Marianne accepted the trade-offs as young artists often do. Marianne wouldn't let Jeffrey help clean the loft and repair it until she had replastered all of the walls herself and made it her own. Soon thereafter, Marianne invited Jeffrey to move in. He recounts, when the loft was barely habitable, we moved all our things in, put a mattress on the floor and called it home. She was clear about what needed to be done. I followed her lead and we got to know each other in the process. She appreciated my energy, hard work and support of her dream. I was smitten by her fearlessness, her sensuality, her intelligence, and her long view devotion to art. The two ran wiring and installed plumbing in the loft. They scavenged board and wood from the street for their kitchen counters. They stole tiles from abandoned buildings for their bathtub. And they worked hard to extend their limited income so that they could keep making artwork. Unable to afford to cast her large-scale works in bronze and iron, Marianne was pioneering in her use of materials and explored a material called bonded iron, which is fiberglass with iron fillings in it. When working with this material, as Jeffrey recalls, the final step was to coat each piece with resin impregnated with iron powder. 
Then she'd take it to the roof, sand it smooth, and leave it for a couple of days wrapped with acid-soaked cloth. When it was unwrapped, there was a sculpture that looked a hundred times heavier than its true weight. Early on, Marianne established themes and interests in her work that would remain throughout her career and prove to be some of the most inspiring and enduring components of her legacy. One of the themes we continually see are works that support and hold one another, often without any hardware, but lean on one another. So this piece, for example, Benchmarks, which is on view here at WICMA, each of the pairs is comprised of two pieces, and the bottom piece needs to be rotated into place so that the top piece can lay on top of it and fit snugly. And we see this again and again in her work, this ability for pieces to hold and support one another. This piece, the well, is comprised of 20 different components that nestle inside one another. So there's a sense of multiple parts coming together for a whole. As recently noted by Cassie Packard in Freeze Magazine, Marianne early in her career began her investments in modularity, biomorphism, and tactility. There's also the simultaneity of the interplay between the organic and the geometric. And Marianne was a prolific journal keeper and um, she would also draw and paint and made works on paper alongside her sculptural practice. And in some of these early works on paper, you can see how she's drawn a very precise and mathematical kind of graph paper behind as the base of the work and then laid organic um, forms on top. She has an interest, oh, this is another piece, I'm sorry, um, it's untitled, also made out of bond and iron, and it's hard to see, but right in the middle is a little seam where these two pieces, they're two independent pieces that come together and fit together. You almost can't see it at all when they're fit precisely, but it's sort of pieces that come together to make a whole again. She had an interest in systems and structures of the body, and again, exploration with materials. Um, this is made out of plywood, and Marianne made all of this work herself um, in the studio space on the Bowery. Again, an exploration of materials um, with aluminum screen, and very much a relationship between sculpture and drawing, which is present throughout her work and throughout her career. This interest in both the mathematical and the precise and the very ordered alongside the organic and natural and biomorphic really makes a lot of sense to me and to um, even Jeffrey as we've talked about this in that Marianne grew up in a family of engineers. Her mother Dorothy was a speech therapist, her father Bill, an engineer. Um, she had two brothers, Richard pictured here and Christopher who wasn't born yet, who also became an engineer. She was born in 1945 in New York City and grew up in New Jersey. As a child, she took classes at the Museum of Modern Art and her family was supportive when she told them at eight years old that she wanted to be an artist. Though she started undergraduate at Mount Holyoke College as a biochemistry major, her parents were supportive when she switched her major to studio art. She graduated Mount Holyoke in 1967, took graduate sculpture courses at the University of California, Berkeley, and traveled extensively to Italy, Switzerland, Nepal, Morocco, Algeria, and other locations. She then came back to New York City and received her MFA from Columbia University in 1975, where she studied with Ronald Bladen and George Sugarman. Her classmates at Columbia included artists Ursula von Reidingsvard, Helene Brandt, Don Picaro, and Vincent Siniglio. In 1980, Marianne and Jeffrey were married, and though Marianne wavered, worrying, like many female identifying artists do now and did then, that having children would overtake her career, their daughter Eve was born in 1982. As Jeffrey recalls, for all her toughness and urgency to pursue art, she enjoyed nesting and caregiving. Once the decision was made, she approached the child goal in a familiar way, envision, strategize, and execute. <laughs> The loft, already a sculpture studio, dark room and home, also became a nursery. And Eve was surrounded by artwork and created alongside her parents, at times assisting Marianne with her work. Uh, 
a member of the Gorilla Girls. It's very hard to see, I'm sure, but Marianne's Unger name, and Marianne Unger's name is over there in alphabetical order in the last column. Uh, Marianne cared deeply about the exclusion of women in the art world and curated and proposed group exhibitions of her work alongside her female colleagues. At a conversation the estate held with artist Petacoin, she reminisced about the salons that she and Marianne would host and attend, sharing slides of their work and discussing what they were thinking and working on. As curator Alexandra Schwartz has said, coming of age in the late 1960s, Unger described her work as post-minimalist, combining the serial practices of minimalism with an interest in organic form, gender, and the body. Issues with which, as a 1970s era feminist, she was deeply engaged. In these early years of having a child, the family also bought a house upstate in upstate New York, and it allowed Marianne to have space to make work, to cite some of her larger works outdoors, and place to store it. As Jeffrey recalls, Marianne put up a pole barn devoted to making and storing sculpture, and it was a place for Eve to be independent, to wander and play. From the beginning and for many more years, it provided us a place of healing and an escape from the city. In 1985, when Eve was three years old, Marianne was diagnosed with breast cancer, which she would battle for the next 13 years. Works that Marianne made at this time express her pain and devastation more figuratively and directly. And she began to work with a process where she would create metal armatures and cover them with hydrocal, a hard form of plaster. She would add cheesecloth and pigment and build up the hydrocal. This is a photograph of Marianne making one of the armatures, welding one of the armatures upstate in the barn in the country with Eve working behind her. And this is another example of what one of the armatures looks like before it's been covered in hydrocal. So they're really the underpinnings and support of the work. Shown in a solo exhibition in 1992, Marianne's Dark Icon series relates to bandaging, pain, scarring, and the body, but in a more abstract form. The same year as the seminal exhibition, Marianne received a Guggenheim Fellowship. This was an abundantly productive period for her and was happening alongside the recurrence of her cancer, a fact made evident by the show's themes. As art historian Joan Martyr noted, with their durable armatures, the icons allude to the sculptor herself, her strength and determination to survive, her will that overcomes all misgivings or doubts. And this is a photograph of Marianne in the studio on Third Street working on the dark icons work with Eve. And there's in the back right corner, you can see another example of the armatures uh, that are underneath the works. And this process of working with hydrocal and layering it with cheesecloth on top to create a skin on those pieces. Between the late 1980s and the mid 1990s, Marianne simultaneously worked on both publicly commissioned artworks and gallery based solo exhibitions. In publicly cited works, you can see her interest in temple-like spaces that are enclosed and that you can enter and walk into, but that are open and airy at the same time. You can feel inside but in nature simultaneously, and Marianne had long been interested in Eastern religions and religious and spiritual spaces. She also participated in Percent for Art programs, and as Jeffrey notes, if she won, she'd make the piece herself to maximize her own bottom line. She set up an assembly line in the studio and hired younger artists to cut out aluminum slotted shapes to then spray paint. These large sheets were shipped to project sites in Phoenix, Fort Lauderdale, or closer to home like Princeton. There Marianne and an assistant would fit them together in brightly colored sculptures structurally sound at heights of 20 or more feet. Art critics often spoke of Unger, Unger's work in this period as having these two distinct voices, public works that are volumetric, brightly colored architectural structures, structures rendered in a kind of geometric formalism, and private works that are solemn, heavy abstractions, rich with intimations of mortality and loss, 
writes George Melrod in Public Art Review in 1993. Though when looked at retrospectively again, so many of the themes established by Marianne are there in both of these types of works. The public works are the armatures that supported all of her work, just not covered in the skins uh, that she would utilize when showing them in gallery locations. So her interest in the skeletal structure, the support, the grids, and the mathematics are there the whole time. In 1994, Marianne mounted her most ambitious project to date, the sculptural installation across the Bering Strait at Trans Hudson Gallery in Jersey City. Comprised of 34 large-scale sculptures, the work made a forceful impact, the themes of which seem prescient today. As Marianne wrote in the artist statement for the show, we may have our hopes for an information superhighway and our dreams of an interconnected world in the technological 21st century, yet it is still the movements of peoples that makes us aware of each other around the world. Migration is arguably the strongest force towards the creation of a global village. Vivian Rayner of the New York Times observed that any way it is viewed, the installation packs a huge punch, and the work's blend of the erotic and the macabre represents a climax in Unger's work that has been building since the mid-1980s. In Marianne Unger to Shape a Moon from Bone, this work is on view in its entirety for the first time since 1994. The mid to late 1990s were the last years of Marianne's life. Many of the works she made during the time were included in her last solo show of her lifetime, which took place in 1997 at the Trans Hudson Gallery and then traveled on to the New Jersey State Museum. The works she here show her thinking of the cycle of life, regeneration, egg-like forms, cellular division. We can see this in titles such as Mitosis and Zygote. This work, Seed Pod, is a, another example of a piece that is really kind of a feat, a feat of engineering and um, her ability to plan and execute works. Um, and it's really incredible because she was drawing and sketching alongside the works she was making. You can really see sketches of works that quite literally become her planning. She was able to execute in her planning. They literally become and look like the sculptures that she was ultimately planning. So this piece, Seed Pod, has the armature as well, as all of these works do, and the two pieces, one slides into the other, and they both, um, that enables both of them to stand up. And these are some examples of Marianne's main wishing stones. Again, egg-like forms, but really a, a reference to kind of smooth amulets or stones you might find at the beach. Um, and Maine was a place where the family spent a lot of time during the years. Also included in this exhibition was Shanks, a seminal work by Unger that's both imposing and vulnerable, and one of just a handful of works that remained white. Shanks has recently entered the permanent collection of the Williams College of Art, the Williams College Museum of Art, and we are overjoyed that it has found such an incredible home. Marianne was in and out of remission throughout this time, and she died on December 27, 1998, in the loft with her husband and daughter by her side. Roberta Smith of the New York Times stated that Marianne Unger's works occupied a territory defined by Ava Hess and Louise Bourgeois, but the pieces combined a sense of mythic power with a sensitivity to shape that was all their own, achieving a subtlety of expression that belied their monumental scale. A couple of posthumous solo exhibitions of Marianne's work took place in 1999 and 2000. And because she had been thinking about her legacy, she had placed works in collections during her lifetime, through her own donations or the donations of her family, or as promised gifts to institutions. So by the early 2000s, Marianne's work was in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. As the family was grieving and learning to live without her, the bulk of her work stayed at the estate and in storage until I was hired in 2007. Three or four years into the slow-going work that I was doing, Marianne and Jeffrey's daughter Eve, an artist and founding co-director of the Wasaic Project, became more and more interested in the goings-on at the estate, and I found I had a co-worker in New York City. 
a passionate, invested coworker who brought so many new ideas to the table. Eve brought her friends, Max and Charlie Davidson, to the estate to give us advice. They contacted us a few days later, asking if we would be interested in them representing the estate. We had our first solo exhibition of Marianne Unger's work in over 10 years at the Davidson Gallery in 2011. Since the founding of the estate in 2007, we have built momentum by leading gallerists, curators, collectors, artists, and art lovers through the estate by appointment. Through dedication and the support and collaboration of the Davidson Gallery, which has mounted three solo, exhibition of Mar three solo exhibitions of Marianne Unger's work since 2011, and a solo booth at the Freeze New York Art Fair Spotlight section in 2019. Through the absolute generosity of curators who were struck by Marianne's work and their willingness to connect us to other curators that they thought should know about it, Marianne Unger works have entered the collections of the Whitney Museum of, the American Art, of American Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Sheldon Museum of Art at the University of Nebraska. Group shows, including her work, have taken place at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Weatherspoon Art Museum, and the Mount Holyoke College Museum of Art. Marianne's work will be included in the Whitney Museum of American Art's upcoming show in the balance between painting and sculpture, 1965 to 1985, which opens next week. Eve is a graduate of Williams College, and the inclusion of her work alongside her mother's in this exhibition marks a lifetime of work and family come full circle. Eve and Marianne will also have a two-person show opening at Davidson Gallery in New York City in January of 2023. The estate is open by appointment, and we currently have an exhibition of Marianne and Jeffrey's work titled The Sword and the Stone that was curated by William Hathaway, Hathaway of Knight Gallery in LA. Please come visit us. As I mentioned earlier, we began this work by ourselves, figuring it out as we went along, one foot in front of the other, hoping someone would hear us. With this stunning exhibition at Williams, it's clear that you have. I'd like to offer just a couple of thank yous before we move on. Um, thank you to the incredible and brilliant and inspiring Horace Ballard. You delved so deeply and thoughtfully into Marianne Unger's work that you emerged with this stunning, moving, and overdue survey now on view here. The exhibition catalog and your contextualizing of Unger's work helps to further establish Marianne Unger as a formidable and important force in the world of art making and introduce or reintroduce her to so many. Thank you to Pamela Franks and Lisa Doran who have championed and supported this exhibition and made it and this symposium possible. And thank you to all of the WICMA staff for their hard work. Thank you to Max Jr., Charlie, and Max Davidson for your support, guidance, and hard work. Thank you to the staff at the Marianne Unger Estate and Jeffrey Biddle Studio for your enthusiasm, energy, and support. Sana Manzor, Ryan Speth, Vanessa Kowalski, Lauren Smith, Jim Gowans, and Adam Ekstrom. Thank you to Jeffrey Biddle for his unwavering commitment to Marianne's work and legacy, and thank you to Eve Biddle for your endless energy, ideas, support for both of your parents' work, and your willingness to grow together in this endeavor with me. Hi, my name is Horace Ballard, and it is my deep honor to be the exhibition curator for Marianne Unger, To Shape a Moon from Bone. There are many, many ways to be a curator, and there are many, many ways to go about the tasks, the compromises, and the partnerships that accrue over time, sometimes over a matter of days, weeks, months, years, to make a show because that show is a record of all the conversations that that artist had, that that curator and that artist had, even conversations beyond the grave. And that show is a gift and an invitation to every single person who comes through, who engages for five minutes, for five hours. In approaching Unger's practice, and especially during the pandemic months of writing about her life and practice, I assembled a chorus of voices that surrounded her and surrounded me. These voices were, in addition to the voices of those who knew and loved her, 
these voices were in addition to the voices on the wall text and the labels. These were the voices of women artists who worked before her time, alongside her time, and in the wake of her time. And in moments when the written record did not give definitive understanding, this incredible grouping of women from across a century of practice allowed me to be precise about a life as our wonderful keynote, yet last night Heather Hart reminded us, a life of critical fabulation and imagination. And I'd like to intone the names of those women now. Barbara Hepworth, Augusta Savage, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, Sarah Ames, Ursula von Reidingsvard, Louise Nevelson, Louise Bourgeois, Louise Cash, Marin Hassinger, Turquoise Dyson, Eve Biddle. If you look in the footnotes of the catalog, these names appear again and again and again. These artists, like Marianne, share a multidisciplinary practice, a practice deeply committed to the tessellations of space and place and capacity. And in so doing, many of them have opted to call their work sculpture. And I am thankful for the clarity and the proficiency and the expertness of their practice. I am thankful for the clarity and proficiency and expertness of their language because together they give us an expanded field of feminist making. And so after the exhibition is up and people are coming, I as a curator look for another chorus, a kind of lyrical and reflective minuet to the sonata adagio of the chorus around writing. And that is a chorus of fellow curators. I wanna to talk to others who have done work that inspires and continues to inspire me. And I wanna have hard conversations about how an artist changes you, even in ways you don't yet know. But the next exhibition is surely different because of that artist's conversation with you. And how that change that an artist enacts a pond, a curator, is not just in the eyes, but it's in the heart. How institutions both support and constrict the work. How collaboration is always audacious. How saying no as a curator is equally audacious. And about what I wish I knew before, and about what I need to still learn. And I am so thankful today that two people who I have not had fulsome conversations in real time with, but whose work has inspired me for years are here. Part of my chorus, two people whose work is where I go to, to look again and to recharge. Dr. Lee Arnold and the wonderful Molly Epstein. And so, their incredible and extensive bios are in your bulletin. Please read them. But now we're going to engage in a bit of a conversation for the next few moments. We'll break a little afternoon for a really nice and fulsome lunch. So I invite Dr. Arnold and Ms. Epstein to the stage, and we'll begin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you for that, Horace. Yeah, thank you so that much. That was an extraordinarily generous introduction. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. 
I told Lee and Molly that I wanted to start with a quote, one of the first quotes that I read from Barbara Hepworth in a book that she wrote about her practice in 1937. It's a bit long, but I think it gets a lot of the my resonant articulators working, but it also gets, I think, a lot of the spatial, sculptural, positive, negative up into the atmosphere, and we can kind of riff. And please, if you have questions, I can no longer see you, but just call out my name and say, Horace, I got a question, or I will do a, do a sweep. So 1937, London. Full sculptural expression is spatial. It is the three-dimensional realization of an idea, either by mass or space construction. The materials for sculpture are unlimited in their variety, quality, tenseness, and aliveness. But for the imaginative idea to be fully and freely projected into stone, wood, or any plastic substance, a complete sensibility to material, an understanding of its inherent quality and character is required. There must be perfect unity between the idea, the substance, and the dimension this unity gives scale. Vitality is not a physical, organic attribute of sculpture. It is the spiritual inner life of an artist's practice. <sighs> For the both of you, in the midst and once an exhibition is up, how do you know what is the feeling, what is the click in the brain that allows you to go, yes, I did it, I did it. Is there words that you can put to that feeling, that moment, whether it's a moment of completeness, of finish, of next chapter, of closing the page, what, what is that click, that change of energy feel like for either of you? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us both. It's a pleasure to see you, Horace, and be with you and see your exhibition and meet the incredible keepers of Marianne's flame. We had an incredible evening last night, and it's a privilege to encounter the work for the first time in person uh, and learn about it through the book um, and be with the people she loved and who love her. Um, and when you talk about an artist changing you, I think that's an experience we've all had. Um, and that's an extraordinary gift of working in this field. Um, it's great to be back in Williamstown for me. I had the privilege of, with my colleague and co-curator, Abigail Roscoman, to work on an exhibition at the Clark over five years' time. And I used to come to Williamstown with great frequency. And I have not been here for about a year. So it's really nice to be back. Um, I think there's something in the durational aspect of exhibition making, which is the research, the planning, the conversations had over time, and then the physical realization of something and sharing it with a public and having those encounters be seen or heard or relayed to oneself. You're now in, ex in an experience where you're living elsewhere, but you get to come back and, and hear about people encountering the show. So something that was very private and very internal in many ways becomes very public and shared. And that shift, I think, um, is very joyful because something that was living within you and in your bloodstream and what you were drinking and eating and talking about and it was all um, part of your internal life becomes a broader conversation with the public. Um, and it's also beyond your control. So something that was very much um, done with intention, uh, done with care and real specificity and a particularness becomes relinquished um, and open for all kinds of interpretation and, and engagement. Um, so I find a lot of joy in watching something flower from the private sphere to the public one. Um, and uh, in terms of artists, changing us, maybe we'll get to that later when we get to the visuals, but I, when you said those words, I, I feel deeply very changed by the artists that I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with. Um, 
and you can see that you've been changed by Marianne, and you can see that in the show and in, in your writing and in your research. That's a tough answer to follow because you captured so much of what happens with exhibition making. Um, but to kind of answer the question of what, how to describe those moments, what is that moment? I think there's kind of two for me personally. Yeah. It's when you finish, you put the labels up on the wall, it's time for lighting, <laughs> and your role in the installation is done, and you're able to just sit with it. It's that moment that's still yours. It's that moment where it's still that private sphere. That's, that's like a, okay, this happened. This came together. It, all of the stars aligned for this moment to happen. The second moment is months later. You've lived with the work, but you've lived with others' experience of the work, mm -hmm. and you've learned so much more about it, having experienced it through the eyes and, you know, and voices of those who've seen it. Um, so that, for me, is that, you know, the second moment is the public reception moment where you've been able to kind of turn yourself inside out um, and reveal all of this stuff that you've been nerding out about for sometimes years, <laughs> let's be honest. And um, then that validation that this is important work, and, um, but also seeing there's so much more. And it like opens up the subject even more. So what you thought was the middle of that onion is in fact yes. the roots go so far deep. So um, yeah, those are two moments that are really important to me in exhibition making. I so appreciate the separating that moment into two moments and I so appreciate the metaphor that is also the physical sensation of the private being made public. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which that exchange across the kind of synapse of life happens for all of us in all of our daily walks with all the things that we love and hold. But there's something about being a curator where it's almost like that's one of the muscles we're building is to do that again and again and again and again and again. And I'm, and I'm wondering for either of you, are there artists, are there projects that you dip a toe in that you're like, someday I will go back. Someday I will be able to explore more of that onion. Someday I will be able to build the project or maybe go smaller. Are, are there, in your own practice, where does the revisiting of artists either currently land or in a hopeful possibility come in? I, I think this actually goes back to something that Heather Hart did for us yesterday when we got to med meditate and she had us think about what was a project and what were the limitations and what would it have been if you had, if you stripped all limitation away, had no budget, had no, nothing. It was just like your dream manifested. And so I was sitting there thinking and, and I was like, there were so many projects that as a curator, there are so many limitations. But I think within those limitations come a lot of creativity and a lot of ways of working around those limitations. And I think that that has been a real big driving force is like working beyond the limitations and working creatively within limitations. But that said, this question of what, what project may have just maybe dipped a toe in or there's so many. It's, and that's, it's almost like every project you wanna return to because as I mentioned before, it's you spend a lot of time on maybe one artist, one aspect of that work to present it to the public. And then the public helps you see all the other facets, or perhaps you're spending more time with that artist after the show's opened, and you're like, well, what about this? Now I want to do that with you, you know? And so it's almost every project I think I've engaged with, 
I want to revisit again, but from a different angle or from a different perspective. So I don't know. The answer is kind of endless for me. <laughs> Sorry, not to give an answer. Oh, I appreciate that, and I think that's real. Yeah. How much for you, Molly. I mean, I think part of the real joy of working in the now, you know, um, being an art historian but really working in the present tense, is that you have relationships with artists over time and space and you sort of continue to orbit back to one another. Mm -hmm. That a conversation that is begun in one moment in time with one institution or one specific project or body of work, that um, those are friendships and dialogues and relationships that unfold over time and you change and they change. Um, I love learning about Marianne's life and work over time. She was transforming as a human being. Um, there were difficulties and challenges and trauma and loss, but part of that is that everyone is in, in a state of transformation. So there's something um, very generative about being engaged with artists around one moment of time. It always comes back in one way or another, and that's because the channel is open, and all of a sudden there's been this exchange, and you know one another, and that will always be true. Um, and I think you find each other again. So that, that feels like the kind of generative gift that keeps on giving, that one conversation that, that might begin now um, inevitably turns up later in perhaps a changed form. That also makes me think about um, exhibitions that I've been working on or have presented of artists who have long prolific careers and maybe my interest might be in a more historical body of work, there is a tension with a living artist who's maybe had, and Linda Bangless is a perfect example, although her, we presented new work of hers. You know, it's the historical work that I think as art historians we learn about at that impressionable age and that's what we want to focus on. But it's working with Linda, I, it's like, she's still making so much fascinating, incredible work. Why not focus on that? Why not shift the focus? So it, it and I'm now working on a show of women artists and, the, and focusing on their work from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, but many of them are still living. Many of them still are fully deserving of solo presentations of what they're working on now. So that's another another thing where it's like, yes, I'm dipping my toe or I'm fully submerging myself in this historical material, but I'm also getting to know the artist, I'm developing friendship with them and a relationship with them, and that means what they're doing at this current moment is just as important and valid and worthy of, you know, exploration again and revisiting again. I brought up a visual for you, Lee, if you want to oh, continue the Bangless. Oh, yeah. I, so, full disclosure, Horace was very generous in his invitation to participate and, and really left it open to interpretation for what kind of images we should bring, which I think is great because that means we're all a little bit off guard, so we're all just kind of learning what we're seeing in the moment. Um, and I, when I was extended this invitation, I was aware of Marianne Unger's work. Whoever does the social media for the estate is doing a fantastic job because I think it was like a couple of years ago, that's how I figured out that I became aware of Marianne Unger as an artist. And so I've been following the estate's account on Instagram and um, so thank you. I don't know who does that, wonderful. But I, I've, I've, all that said, I haven't delved too deeply into her career and so when I received this invitation, I tried to do as much research as I could. <laughs> and also wanting to tie it back to experiences of artists that I've worked with, um, artists of Marianne's generation, um, and projects that I've done, and Linda Bangless is one who comes up who's worked in similar ways, right? Um, working in large scale, working with public projects. Her sculpture is abstract, but can also be described as biomorphic. And so I found there, was the, there were these affinities between these two artists. And, and this is an image of an installation that just closed at the Nasher Sculpture Center and one of our backwater features, which 
we will be talking about another sculpture by another artist um, shortly, which also features in that backwater feature. But it's a fountain uh, that Linda made. The first edition was at Storm King in 2014. She, um, when we decided to do a show together, she wanted to do another edition. And um, this is in this black patinated bronze, which is gorgeous. But I love this um, ambiguity of form. It's this endless column. It's these vertical cornucopias that are um, overflowing with water. Uh, they're incredibly phallic, but at the same time, they're vessels that are holding the water. Um, and so it's just this really strong statement that I think is, while Linda would never s describe herself as a feminist, I do think it is this incredibly strong feminist statement. This is bronze, which has a huge history of, you know, in tradition and sculpture incredibly scaled works involving engineering, um, the, the fact that they're a fountain, we can talk about that when we get to talking about sketch for a fountain. Um, the fact that there are these phallic forms, but also vaginal. And also, I didn't include an Im image, but this uh, sculpture was at the back of our garden. Um, and to, pa to get to it, you have to pass by Richard Serra's My Curves Are Not Mad, which is this incredible horizontal sculpture, very much a Richard Serra. And um, it's this, you know, very heavy statement, but also grand scale. And it's like Linda was just a little bit like, well, I can do something too. <laughs> and um, just a wonderful work. And it was great to, you know, be able to experience this exhibition building with Linda, who, while she understands everybody's interest in the historical material, she's very much engaged with what is she thinking about now? And I felt that that was incredibly important to present new work of an artist who in some ways has been eclipsed by her early work. I, I am so thankful that you brought us Linda Bangless here um, because it reminds me of my very first show at Williams, which was to install a recent acquisition, which was a 1972 Sam Gilliam drape. Mm -hmm. And the joy and the terror of a young curator whose like third artist visit in their life <laughs> is to go to DC to talk to Sam Gilliam. Yeah about 1972, um, and all of his great insistence, um, and also his clarity and his rigor and his deep kindness. However, out of that conversation, my entire plans got scrapped because he said something when I hugged him goodbye. He said, oh, hey, and just so you know, my favorite artists are Linda Bangless and Lee Krasner, and I've never been in a show with them. So, you know, if you got stuff, that would be kind of cool. And I was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we're going to put Sam in a show. And so we installed the show three different times and three different conversations, but the presentation I was most proud of, the presentation that um, he was most proud of was him in a room with Linda Bangless, with Joan Mitchell, with Lee Krasner, he was like, and Helen Frankenthaler. He was like, these are my ladies, yeah. they were the first ones who supported me, and we are all dealing with the sense of the current work, the work from the 90s versus the work from the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. Everyone wants to talk about that, that work didn't sell. This work, let's talk about that. Yeah. And it was the joy, the joy of my months of planning to go down the tube and to listen and to hear. And Linda Bangless um, is even more dear to me because of that relationship with, with Sam. Yeah. Oh, it's good to see that work. Horace, yes. Directly into the mic. You can't hear me. So sorry. <laughs> How are we doing? Are we okay? Everybody else okay? We're doing good. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. I will hold this. <laughs> Do you want to look at the other fountain? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so 
I brought this image of um, a version of Fountain by Nicole Eisenman in part because it's a work that Lee and I share in many ways. Um, the work, as many of you may know, debuted at um, Sculpture Project Munster in 2017. It was titled Sketch for a Fountain, and it was installed in this incredibly you know, Arcadian idyll of this gorgeous park in Munster where actually Martin Kippenberger had cited a piece previously, which Nicole had remembered well. Um, and in that iteration, three of the figures were rendered in plaster and two in bronze. The work was up for six months. It was heavily used. Kids played in the water feature. It was meant to be used, and Nicole was really thinking about how to make a public sculpture for a community that would represent that community, that would be used by that community, and that could kind of redefine our idea of what a public sculpture looked like and felt like, the materials with which it was made, how it could be interacted with. Um, and the piece was so beloved that actually the community of Munster raised money and together with Nicole and her dealer, you know, the work was able to, to stay permanently. But um, an addition of the work resides at the Nasher um, Sculpture Center in Dallas in the Sculpture Garden. and. This is a version of the work um, which we had the privilege of working with Nicole on to bring it to a public park in Boston where it lives permanently in the Fenway neighborhood. Um, and I love this work um, and it's a very joyful and pretty extraordinary object for many reasons, formal and otherwise. Um, if you get up close, you can see that the lying figure with the beer can is a functional fountain. And the seated figure here, there's uh, fountain components coming out of the leg hair on the sculpture. And, um, you know, to work in bronze, uh, Lee talked about this in regards to Linda Benglis and that fountain, but to work in bronze, this storied material that is so laden with connotation that is occupied by so many histories and so many giants of sculpture, right? Sculpture with a capital S. Um, and to make it do something contemporary, I think is this extraordinary innovation uh, on Nicole's part. And to make it perform differently than expected. So who do you expect to see rendered in bronze? What do you imagine a public monument, quote unquote, to look like? And how does that manifest? And to imagine instead this group, Nicole calls them her guys, but you know, these, these uh, differently bodied human beings surrounding this pool in various um, situations of repose and rest and leisure. Um, and to see it in Germany, in a village where people ride bicycles and gather in this space to picnic and families are around and to have visited it in Dallas where it's beautifully installed amongst these major peers of sculpture with a capital S. And then to see it here in Boston where it's at, you know, in a very populated spot it is used, this park. Um, you know, the Fenway is home to educational institutions and Harvard teaching hospitals and Fenway Park, and it has many, it wears many hats as a location, and it's also changed a lot over the last 20, 25 years. Um, but to think about an artist who, I think Nicole and Casper Koenig talked about this work for six, seven, eight years, she's, you know, they started making sculpture in 2011 at a show at Studio Voltaire in London, um, and then at the Carnegie International in 2013. But to, to reimagine a public sculpture as a gathering place, and to make the work um, embody the pose, the community, and the activity of what it is to be in community, and to be in contemporary community. Um, so, I love that this work exists in many places. Wherever it goes, it is deeply adored mm -hmm. and interacted with and engaged. This is not a static object. This is, a, you know, this is a collection of sculptures that um, 
is dynamic at all times. And I'm curious, I know I was in Dallas last in April and it had just been deinstalled, so I didn't get to visit it on that trip. But how has the impact been? Because around it is Hepworth, yep. Noguchi, right? I mean, Hepworth, Sarah. Sarah, always Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's there. He'll never leave the garden. Uh, <laughs> Shapiro, you know, um, who else? We rotate, but you know, Degas. It's just all all sorts. Tradi it, it's a very somewhat, it's somewhat situated in a very traditional and kind of more on the modernist bent of sculpture. Mm. Um, and also, I mean, I'll just preface my next question kind of to you with this statement that it's a beloved sculpture. We just put it back on view. Um, it, it got a bath, it got a nice cleaning. Um, it's, all, it's all shiny and, and ready for public viewing and it is incredibly beloved. And we, I enjoy having it out on view. The public does too. But it is a museum that it's installed. And so, you know, there is this kind of hands-offness. The engagement is a look, don't touch engagement. Um, because, you know, as, as people, you know, at, as a museum, our first, you know, responsibility is to protect the art, but also to protect our patrons. So I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about what that does to the work by situating it in, in a more private setting? Yes, we are a museum and we're open to the public, but at the same time, we're in a, we have a wall around our garden, you know, and you, you can come in, you can sit next to the figures, you can sit, but climbing on them is like verboten. Um, so I'm just curious, what do you think that does to the work? And I think last night you maybe even mentioned that Nicole expressed some hesitation to having the work only situated within museum collections, that it was very important to them to have it at least in addition in a public spot. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think both are necessary and both are important. The work is such an extraordinary gesture of contemporary life and it belongs alongside those peers in your sculpture garden, no question. And I actually think it's very important that it resides there mm -hmm. for your public, for your visitors, and the story that your collection tells over time. I think we had the good fortune of getting to work with Nicole on this project, and in, in many ways is a reason that additioning sculpture can be meaningful as a tool mm -hmm. so that it isn't just about a singular experience or a singular encounter. And we'll look at another work shortly that is unique, that does not replicate, that do can't exist in two places at once. But I do think that having the work exist simultaneously in Munster, in Boston, in Dallas, in three very different contexts for three different urban populaces, that that is part of the vision and the impact. And so I think in Nicole's mind, it was a benefit to both be elevated, you know, in the elevated museum context where they very much belong for many reasons, um, and also to have the work in public space where it is accessible, where there, and I could have brought other images of children frolicking in the water because that happens, and that was part of the intention. That was really part of the idea in Munster initially. And so um, I think to be able to, to recreate that in, in a way here is valid and important, but I also think the work um, performs in different ways. And as a study in monumental bronze sculpture made today, I'm so glad it's at the Nasher. I'm so glad that it's in dialogue with, with the work that surrounds it. And I'm thrilled that in a public park in Boston that is close to the Museum of Fine Arts, that's close to the Isabella Stork Gardner Museum, that is part of a kind of Boston arts campus for sure, 
but is also accessible to the person walking by who may not you know, identify themselves as a consumer of culture, or, you know, someone who, who would necessarily walk through the doors of a museum by choice, but where that experience is accessible and horizontal and democratic and available at all hours of the day or night. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad, it, I'm glad it has both lives. I love that question, Lee, and I love your response, Molly. And it reminds me, Molly, of something that you said when we were out in the vestibule coming in, thinking about the radicality of the artist's gesture, but also the historiography and the radicality of the material, and that an artist's intent and an artist's choice in that material can really open up a much broader conversation than we often give material or artists credit for. Because for as historic and as um, monolithic the canon has been around bronze sculpture, particularly modern bronze sculpture, with certain casting processes, you do have the ability to replicate it. And sculpture in that more traditional sense also is almost like photography in the way in which it can replicate. There are so many hands. The idea of the kind of quintessential moment is already in plethora at the moment that we encounter it. And so I love, 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 love that in Eisenman's work, all of that is in play, as well as the deep generosity of their spirit. And I, and I think this is a, such a beautiful example of all of those things. It's Nicole has a great line that I love, and I have to share it because I think it's genius. Um, Nicole said that painting happens from the neck up and sculpture happens from the neck down. Mm. And I think that that's about how they make things. I think it's about, you know, the intellectual, the cerebral, the academic process, and then the body, like the sheer activity of being in spatial relationship to something else mm -hmm. and the visceralness of that and how that's undeniable. You're not dealing with an image. You're not processing an image. You're actually, your body is in relationship to a thing in space, to an object. And that changes the conversation, I think, entirely. And I love that, I love that sentiment because I think, um, the body itself and how heads are rendered and how bodies are rendered, but also how we move through the world and, um, and how we can think about things in, in three dimensions and, and things in two dimensions and how they are different. Are there other images or projects that either of you bought that you would like to share? Sure. Ooh. <laughs> Do you know this work? Yeah. Uh, so Jody Pinto, um, brilliant artist, spent most of her early career in Philadelphia and then now lives and works in New York. And I was thinking a lot about public sculpture and this is a nice you know, tie into this conversation we were having about Nicole Eisenman's work in the public and how, especially for Munster, she was very interested in engaging with that population, engaging with that community, understanding what, what might best serve the community in terms of a public art sculpture. And this is a great example of um, an artist who is very sensitive, works at a pretty extreme scale, um, architectural, essentially, worked with an engineer to ensure that this bridge would not collapse. But also, um, this is the Wissahickon River outside of Philadelphia. Um, she was invited to make a work for this park. She was given, you know, free reign to choose a site. And while she was doing her site visits and um, interacting, engaging with community members and, you know, people who oversee the park, she kept hearing stories about this bridge that existed somewhere out in the park. And it was in disrepair, I mean, completely had, was not usable, unsafe, et cetera. But there were the remnants of the stairs and um, 
she then began to learn about the covered bridges and, and how there was such a big tradition of them in the area and, and wanting to reconstruct a bridge. But also in the vein of Jodi Pinto, a lot of her work is very anthropomorphic. Um, and it's very, you know, she's very much along the vein of the, um, by, oh my gosh, I'm blanking, bio, biomorphism. And so this idea of something that's abstracted but also resembling um, the human body. And she loved this idea of creating a gesture with just a finger mm. and as if this finger would come down and touch both sides of this area and create the bridge. And in creating this bridge, which is a public sculpture, um, you know, touching two sides, bringing them together, but also when it's engaged with by the public, walking across it, she describes the, that interaction as those activating the sculpture, but also becoming the muscle and the sinew of the sculpture, which I think is so wonderful. Yeah. And so I was just really, you know, with Marianne Unger on my brain, mm -hmm. I was thinking too about public projects, public sculpture, and I, it's another example of an artist who was very sensitive to the place and very sensitive to the needs. And also she was giving this talk about the process um, and she was, you know, taking feedback from the public. And at a certain point, people were sending her kind of memories or recollections, oh. but they were um, of that site. They were sending her memories of the bridges, that the bridge that had been there, and even sending her drawings. And she realized that they were sending her their ideas for the bridge. And she was, it was kind of this wonderful thing of, you know, really getting a sense of the place and what people needed. And she said, you know, I had my own idea for the bridge, but it was a way to kind of marry um, this engagement. So I just, I love this work and I, I love Jody Pinto's work. So I felt it was important to kind of bring to attention in this context. That's so beautiful. Allison showed us um, many of Marianne's site-specific pieces um, through Percent for Art and also other commissions. And Allison made the salient point that the armature, the mathematical precision, the geometric, I would say, lyricism, there in both the work in the galleries and in these um, site-specific places, but the difference is the skein, mm -hmm. right? But even in Marianne's work, when you can walk into them and still be in nature, mm -hmm. the human becomes the heart, the human becomes the muscle. And so to see that in Pinto's formulation and critical fabulation here is a beautiful resonance. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yes. This yes. Another material that <laughs> has been utilized differently in the past very broadly as this very kind of yes. robust, hefty. Industrial. Thing. Yep, and she spoke very openly about the choice of core 10. It's a living material. Mm. It's ever-changing um, as exposure to the elements occurs. The surface changes and it will always be alive. But also she wanted a material that would blend with the nature around it and also be alive, living in concert with nature around it, yeah. It's beautiful. I would too, I, I haven't. Too. Yep, outside of Philly, like uh, Northwest Philly. What Center. a beautiful way to take the joint, the, the, that and just kind of, just, just, Put your mic up. Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna rewind us, sorry. Not the most elegant exit. Yes. This is really nice how this has flowed, I have to say. Oh, <laughs> <so glad. laughs> Very organic. Um, well, speaking of joints and you know, spending time with Shanks in the gallery last night for the first time. And I know Sarah Montrass mentions Nairi Bagramian's work in the roundtable discussion that was published in the catalog that Horace, you had with Eve and Sarah. 
Um, but in, in thinking about um, storied material, material with the burden of history and connotation, um, when we invited Nairi Bagramian to come visit the Clark for the first time in November of 2018, um, she had never been here before. She spent time with the collection, with the architecture in the 140-acre landscape. Um, and she qu quite quickly kind of honed in on both the concept for the sculpture and the idea that it would be the first time that she would work in marble. Mm. So um, she talked about this realization about centuries of art history where two primary joints, our knees and our elbows, have been responsible for maintaining the pose, whether that's Degas' ballet dancers or Kate Colwitz, you know, embracing figures in the Clark's collection, contrapposto of Greek and Roman sculptures, that um, every pose that is captured in a painting or a sculpture the weight and the labor of maintaining that pose is actually falling quite literally on our knees and our elbows. And that's also true in how we move through the world every day, walking up Stone Hill, for example. So when Nairi came to visit, she had this experience of spending time in the galleries and then walking up the hill. And she asked the question of what, what would it feel like to give the knee and the elbow a rest? What would it be to kind of extricate them from their typical anatomical uh, orientation and let them pause in this moment of repose in front of a gorgeous vista and a landscape and, and give them a break after these centuries of holding tension? Um, so that was the idea of, of the sculpture was... Um, these abstracted forms of the knee and elbow and, and to think about the body in space. Um, and Nairi was quite swift in, in centering on marble. She never worked in marble before. It's obviously this material around permanence and perfection. Um, and she worked with a quarry in Kircheta. Um, this family had made work with Arp, had made work with Bourgeois and Noguchi, a very storied, special place. Um, but she decided to really subvert our expectation of what marble and the surface of the material should be and could be. So the surface is heavily pitted and pockmarked by chiseling. And then the interior of the sculpture, where the stainless steel components act as a kind of cartilage or marrow, the inside of the marble was heavily polished. So. Um, she talks about this idea of phantom schmaltz in German, phantom pain in English, of the vulnerability and the fragility of the body underneath that is unrevealed. And in the sculpture, she was really probing this question of how do we move through space? How can we pause? And also, how can we change? So I think in the, in the idea of the pose, um, and she's deeply influenced by modern dance and Yvonne Rayner and ideas of, you know, if bodies can be sculptures, then why can't sculptures be bodies? Or if bodies, uh, if dancers can be sculptures, then why can't sculptures be dancers? So um, I love this work. It was a dream to work on with Nairi and to have it in the Clark landscape for a year through winter, through snow, through cows rubbing up against the side because <coughs> it felt so nice on their flank. Um, but I, I really appreciate, in terms of artists changing you and this question you posed at the beginning of the conversation, Nairi talks a lot about how sculpture should be allowed to fail how sculpture should be allowed to not meet expectations, how sculpture um, should be allowed to investigate problems and questions and not answer them. And I feel very changed by the experience of working on this project with her and working on this project with all the artists. But this idea that we can, if we can stop and assume a pose, it also means we can change. And I think she thinks about that in terms of society and social choices. Um, and Heather talked last night about language and the monikers and how we name things. And early on in the pandemic, Nairi talked about 
why, why is it called social distancing? Why can't it be careful closeness? Like why, why is the choice this setting us apart instead of bringing us together safely? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot about, about that. Um, and I, I loved the idea of marble in this new guise, that the Clark is full of treasures of the past. And, um, and what does it look like now to think about the body and space with all of the history in mind? Um, but, but what is a new question to pose? I always think about Bernini when I see this work because he was such a, I mean, a virtuoso with rendering his marble sculptures, the flesh, yes, the hand digging into the thigh. Um, and that was considered this, it was almost like magic. Like he was bringing his sculpture to life um, because he was able to render flesh so realistically. And yet, this is, to me, a very realistic depiction of flesh in rendered in marble as well. It's just not the idealized, perfected, airbrushed flesh of Bernini's sculptures. It's, it's the skin of a sculpture that's been through some things. Or maybe just has bigger pores, you know? <laughs> So I just, I, I love, love to that. see that, I love looking at this and then it, it makes me think so much about, because it's marble, what is the history of marble? What, what were people renowned for? Um, they were renowned for making it look real, right? And, and here, I think this is a real, this is still just another take on making marble resemble flesh just in a more realistic way. I love that. I'm going <laughs> to tell Nairi. She's going to love that, too. You can see why I wanted to speak to these two. Right? Yeah. Oh, sure. And I will just plug the Nasher one last time. Um, <laughs> Nairi Bagramian's opening a show with us this next week, so that's fantastic. Everyone get thee to Dallas. Yes. It's really <laughs> worth really worth seeing in person. Um, this slide is a, a bit of a cheat because uh, it's number three of the slides we were given. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I wanted to just throw a lot of images up there. But I've been in a very deep headspace in land art for the past several years. Um, I'm working on a show that's going to feature just women who are involved in land art. Um, it's a historical show, so it's going to be looking at work from the 60s up through 1990. And so, uh, but notably, all the artists that I'm looking at, of course, engage with sculpture. And I think what land art allowed many of them to consider was this idea of taking up space, but also considerations of space in a variety of ways. And um, the show is important for me uh, in that we kind of drop this traditional notion of land art as this um, you know, male-dominated movement, um, you know, destructive gestures out into a landscape that s those artists called empty, but which communities that had been living there would certainly describe differently. Um, and to think about it in terms of engagement with space, but just out of the studio. And so thinking about artists like Marin Hassinger, who you mentioned, who I consider a land artist because of her interest and engagement with nature, but also the abutment of nature and man, mankind, humankind, civilization, the built environment. Um, and so a lot of her projects that engage with those issues, but they're on the periphery of civilization or they're on the peripheries of you know, a, a highway, for example, which is this image here in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so this show is very much in my brain and I'm thinking uh, it's a variety of artists who are very much Marianne Unger's contemporaries. They're all born roughly in the 40s, um, many of them still with us. Um, sadly, some of them are not. Um, and just how they each approached this idea of space exploration in different ways um, through putting their body directly into the landscape as with Ana Mendieta and photographing it, 
dropping a scroll of handmade paper down the side of a riverbed, the Niagara Gorge piece by Michelle Stewart, and rubbing that paper uh, with the exact earth that's beneath it, so really giving an imprint of that. Um, another Jody Pinto example, Alice Acock, Heather, forgive me for my question yesterday, compare, you know, asking if you thought about Alice Acock. She's, again, on my brain quite, quite often these days. Nancy Holt, who, of course, we all probably are familiar with her Sun Tunnels project, but she did a number of other incredibly important works that I hope we'll all be able to discover together. Um, so that's just my way of also another plug for the Nasher, but things that are on my brain and allowing us to look at some projects that are really important, historical projects that I think should be just as well known as Spiral Jetty or the city or, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, truly. Yeah. That's going to be an amazing show. When is it, Lee? Next fall, 2023. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Um, yeah. Is there a title? Uh, maybe everybody can help me with this. <laughs> <laughs> I had started with a title that we're, we've since dropped for a number of reasons. Um, no Man's Land. Oh. Yeah. What's that Love subtitle? It. It's gone. So that's gone. So now it's just women of land art. So let's all collectively oh, <laughs> come up with a new title. <laughs> uh, but notably, I think there's, there's something in that women of land art, which is kind of interesting to pick apart. Um, it's not, it was about the artists, but it was also about those around the artists who were supporting them, writing about mm -hmm. the work. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, those were women. So Lucy Lepard, of course, is oh. the biggest, um, the most recognizable name that would be supportive, but April Kingsley wrote quite frequently. I mean, there were and a number of curators who worked with these artists at projects like Art Park or mm -hmm. um, the Nassau Museum for a huge Mary Miss installation were women. And so thinking about the network and not just the women artists, but how it really took women yes. broadly to kind of make these works happen. I mean, I love that in thinking about through the lens of Marianne, mm -hmm. her incredible interventions at Socrates Sculpture Park yes. was by invitation of women who work there yeah. and who are supporters and on that board there. In some ways, I feel like No Man's Land is a beautiful name for like programming Yeah, that brings like contemporary artists and thinkers mm. in to engage it. But something as you rightfully say that captures that deeply matrix network mm -hmm. of women in the fruitful and fulsome creation of these works. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the stuff. Yeah. yeah. Can you design an image of a title where the reflective land of women? Mm, yeah. I like, let's keep workshopping this. This is fantastic. That's good. <laughs> I have one more. Yeah, let's slide. If we have time, do we have time, Horace? I, yes, we, we do. We do. Yes, yeah. we do. Um, well, <gasps> it's interesting to turn to Jenny C. Jones after mm -hmm. talking about Wow. Land art and scale. Um, this was also in our exhibition at the Clark titled Groundwork. And you can see the sculpture at the end of the Tadeo Ando wall that extends out from the new building. Um, but it's the work made out of um, aluminum and wood at the end of the wall, which is actually a functioning Aeolian harp. Um, a, when, a what now? So um, <laughs> an Aeolian harp is a harp played by the wind, not touched by human hands. And in the 19th century, they used to sit in the windows of people's homes, and they, were, um, they had different kind of spiritual connotations. But when we invited Jenny to be in the show, and it was her first time working outside the white Cuban, being outside in the landscape, um, first time working with a fabricator outside of the studio, 
and she was thinking of something that could be affected by the landscape and affected by the conditions of the site. Um, she was also strongly, as you can see, responding to the architecture. The dimensions of the sculpture echo exactly the dimensions of the wall, and if you're standing directly in front of it, it almost recedes entirely. Um, but when Jenny came to visit the Clark, um, we were out in the landscape and she took home a copy of the collection catalog and spent a lot of time looking at the collection objects and she was um, immediately taken by these two paintings by Winslow Homer, uh, paintings of the Atlantic Ocean, which Jenny immediately identified as portraits of the Middle Passage. And um, that was a new reading, right? A reading that hadn't been given voice in previous scholarship. Um, and so the sculpture is titled, speaking of titles, I think this title is extremely evocative and um, effective. It's called uh, These Mournful Shores. And the strings of the harp were played by the weather and the shifting weather conditions, the wind. Um, and they were meant to call out almost in a duet with the water feature of the building and the Homer paintings mm -hmm. situated in the gallery directly opposite where the sculpture was installed in a kind of call and response um, and a, a siren song to those lost at sea. Um, and sound and audio is really vital and important to Jenny's practice. Um, and she also talked about the harp, as you mentioned, Augusta Savage, in your opening remarks, um, who is an extraordinary figure more people should know of and should know the story of and the history of. Um, but uh, she was the only um, female artist, an artist of color, who was invited to make a work for the 1939 New York World's Fair. And she made this extraordinary 16-foot tall painted plaster harp made out of figures. And um, there were small maquettes made that people could buy as souvenirs from the World's Fair. One is actually on view right now in the Venice Biennale in Cecilia Alemani's um, main pavilion in the show called The Witcher's Cradle. It's tucked away in a vitrine. You have to look for it, but it's an extraordinary object. But the monumental harp was never cast in bronze and it was destroyed. So something that Jenny was thinking about in this piece was really honoring that legacy and also that of Alice Coltrane, who was a harpist, an extraordinary musician and composer of experimental music, but far less well known than John, right? Um, but part of what working on this project with Jenny and learning about Augusta Savage made me think about is not just what is made, but what is kept. Mm. So part of being here mm. this week, which is such an honor, is to see what Allison and Eve and Jeffrey have done, which is to be the keepers of the flame, because this doesn't happen. Mm. Things don't get kept and maintained and shown and published and shared unless there is a dogged determination and a commitment for work to, to find its way into the world. Um, and so kudos to you for that. Here, and here. to artists like Jenny, who you know were bringing other histories to light through her own practice, which um, Though monumental in scale has an extraordinary poetry um, and, and nuance and rigor that I admire tremendously. Amen. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> it has been the pleasure of a career to talk to both of you. <laughs> and I hope um, now with this first conversation, we'll talk all the time. Yeah. Please, um, please, I welcome Thank you that. so much yeah. for having oh us. Oh my thank goodness, you. thank you both for coming. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lisa. I would love to. Questions, comments, things on the heart and the mind. Yes. Is that me recording? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been wanting to say at some point, I don't know whether you can all hear me, but yeah. it's thanks to you that I realize now why I have such a, I appreciate so much modern art, because I was a classmate of Marianne Unger, Joellen Knight, Marianne Mears, Jill Morgan, they were all at Mount Holyoke at the same time, mm -hmm. students of Leonard Bologna. 
I spent a lot of time at the sculpture studio, which had a, they did welding, that was new. They did bronze casting, that was new. And it's because of them that I realized, only realize now, that's, that's why I have always really appreciated and loved modern sculpture and other modern art too. But it's because of, so thanks to curators like you bringing them forward, I hope that others will be able to have a lifelong appreciation too. But that's, that's my whole life. I, because I was at Mount Holy at an early age, I was 20 when I graduated, so I knew them all when I was 18, 19, 20. And I didn't really realize till now that it's because of them and seeing, seeing what they were doing and so devoted to, as I was working on medieval history and the origins of the First Crusade, I would wander over from the library afterwards to the, the welding studio and the sculpture studio and just sort of watch them. So. Thank you all. Keep, keep on the good work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, please. I have a question about um, separating out genders as a curator. So uh, you're working on uh, women on the land of, of some sort. And so what does that mean to separate them out? I know what it means as an artist to, to separate out women and men, but what, I'd love to hear some more. Sure. This is a... This is a question always for a curator. Um, there are kind of opposing sentiments, and I don't know where you fall on the spectrum, but I know many artists, um, especially the women, when I approach them about this particular show, um, there is this fear that there'll be, it's going to be ghettoizing or it's going to just further create distance between their careers and their male counterparts. The frustrating thing is that men would never blink an eye if we were to say, I'm doing a land art show and I'm featuring Smiths and Heiser and Dame Maria. And it's like, yeah, that's it. That's the story. Um, and, you know, Lucy Lepard, I think, maybe was the one who said this, but I could be attributing it to her. I think it's my attitude is as long as there are these um, discrepancies or as long as there is not parity within representation of women and men and genders, that that work needs to continue. And I, I have been asked, why not do a land art show that includes women and men? And, but again, that's giving more space to the male artists who have had that space for many years. Why not just focus on work that is completely underknown, under-recognized, and really put a spotlight on it? And hey, it happens to be women because historically their work was not known. It wasn't published as frequently. It wasn't supported monetarily. Um, as much as their male counterparts. So it is, I, I know that there is that kind of tension between, well, if you just do a show of women, it's again furthering it, furthering the problem, but I, my attitude is that, well, until the Nasher collection achieves parity, until our exhibition program achieves parity, I think it's important to keep spotlighting it and not cede any more space to artists who have already had their time in the sun. So that's that's kind of where I land on that. Do you have any thoughts to add? Well, our show at the Clark had six artists and they were all women, but it was not by design. Um, and we got asked about it a lot. And our answer was always the same, which is we wanted to make a show about sculpture and the landscape and about responses to a site and all of its inherent truths from the architecture to the objects within the building, to the trails, to the shifting seasons, to you know, everything that was embodied by the site. And we spent time in the studio with artists we admired and we invited them to make new work and they all happened to be women. But that was not the thesis, it was not the mandate and it was not done with intentionality. Um, but it's evident, you know, um, but, it, uh, 
And maybe that's enough. I mean, maybe that's. One more. Yes, please. Um, hi, thank you. I'm thinking about uh, permanence. Um, uh, you mentioned Richard Serra piece. Maybe it, was, maybe it was a joke, but I think it's, it's also, you know, it's also the case where, you know, I've seen, um, for example, like at the MFA Boston, they had the Women Take the Floor exhibition, which is really great installation of works in the permanent collection by women. And if you went up there and you looked up, there's a calder, there was a calder mobile that couldn't come down. So I wonder about how we think about um, permanence when we have having these interventions like the people who've been marginalized. Um, is permanence something we just want to get rid of? Is it like, I, I don't know, just, yeah. I, I love that question, thank you so much. Um, and also it kind of ties into what you were, what you closed with, which was this brilliant, recognition of what the estate is doing, they're helping to keep what's being kept, right? Um, what, is, what is worthy of being kept? And how much it takes to keep things and also put them back out there. So that gets to this question of permanence. And the Sarah thing was kind of in jest because it's just an enormous work of art and it just is like, fine, it'd just be a real big pain in the butt to try and remove it if you were just thinking we're gonna remove it temporarily. Um, but there, I just had a conversation with this about, uh, about the subject with my director because, okay, the material of Corten steel, that's the Richard Serra, and it implies all of this permanence, et cetera. Just up the road in Dallas, there's this shopping center which has become world famous because our museum founders used it as a place to show their private collection. So it became this wonderful place where you would see really good really good works of art, but in a very public setting. Where the building was built in 1965 and they won the Design of the Decade Award in 1970. They, the founders of our museum used that money to commission Beverly Pepper to make a site-specific land work outside of the shopping center. And she spent four years visiting Dallas, making the work, it was called Dallas Land Canal and Hillside. It was, I think, one of her first interventions into the landscape. By my knowledge, the first work of land art in the state of Texas. Um, so this incredibly important work for numerous people, for Beverly Pepper, certainly, for the Nashers, for the city of Dallas, for me, interested in land art and women. Um, it was completely site-specific. It was using Corten steel plates that had been cut into triangular shapes, and she created earth mounds that these um, panels were basically installed. And it was in this traffic pattern, so it was on like an island where you would drive around it. So understanding Dallas, Beverly Pepper made a sculpture about the experience, your viewing experiences from a car, which is like so brilliant. She's so brilliant. Um, this work has been deinstalled just within the last year. And it, it was deinstalled by the people who now own the, the, um, the shopping center, who are the, you know, the, rel the descendants of our museum founders. And the reason they were planning to just reorient the traffic pattern um, and reorient the entrance or something. And, you know, it was kind of, Shocking, but also really just sad and tragic that there was no long-term plan for this work that was so important and really kind of foundational, I think, for the shopping center, for their parents' um, collection, their, you know, legacy, etc. Okay, contrast that to um, another work of Corten Steel by Robert Irwin in Dallas, which was a public work commissioned in the late 70s. Um, Portal Park Slice, it was also site specific, also notably related to traffic patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Artists really understand Dallas because I think when you do a site visit in Dallas, you're just in the car so much. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so it's this incredible site-specific sculpture. It was intended to um, basically 
act as an entry or like a gateway to a particular district of downtown Dallas. Um, it was accessioned into the public collection, which notably had no funding for restoration, maintenance, and this is not an issue that's, you know, specific to Dallas. I think most public art, you know, um, organizations throughout the country failed to kind of build in maintenance and repair um, into their budgets when they established themselves. And so now there's a lot of work being done to rectify that. But this idea that Robert Irwin thought it was a permanent work, Beverly Pepper thought it was a permanent work, but for Beverly's piece, it's removed, so that permanence is no longer null. With Robert Irwin, it goes, you know, it kind of became an eyesore because nobody was cleaning it up after it became, you know, defaced through graffiti or uh, became a public toilet, you know, these kinds of things. And um, eventually, the city of Dallas wants to redo the traffic pattern. <laughs> So they remove it and they speak with the artist and he says just, you know, it's, it's no longer, the meaning of the work is gone if you change the pattern, so just destroy it. But there were some citizens in Dallas that said, no, we, we really want to make this right. We want to work with you. And so he was actually, he actually made a new work that is site specific and cuts through it. But that to me is such a beautiful story. But then when you think about the fate of the Beverly Pepper, it is a very frustrating story because certain people decided what was permanent and what was not. And I know that I'm not an artist, but I, in conversations with artists, there are varying attitudes. A lot of the attitude is once I make something and it's out in the world, it's not mine anymore. And I think, but I know that there is still a part of that artist that says, but I wanted that to be permanent that was meant to be there, you know? And so it's, it's a great question, and I think there is a lot to be said about decisions and choices that are made to keep things, to maintain things, and, and how much work really goes into um, those decisions. I have one more quick Nairi story about permanence, which is that her work for Sculpture Project Munster in 2017, the same year as Nicole's sketch for a fountain, she specifically chose to cite it where there had been a Richard Serra in 1987. <laughs> and that was a choice about site mm -hmm. and location and the residue of history that never truly disappears. Um, that work, titled Privilege Points was acquired by SF MoMA. It's in their permanent collection. It's installed on the fourth floor. You should go see it. And on the floor of the fourth floor gallery where it resides are marks on the floor from where a Dan Graham pavilion had been installed previously. And I think that history, that is part of what she as an artist working today is responding to and is cognizant of, and that's part of her practice, which is about the politics of power the politics of material and the spaces we occupy and how and when. And I think the permanence question is a super compelling one and very complex. Um, and I also think this idea of change and repositioning um, and how to acknowledge the past, the Calder hanging in the atrium, which is an icon of modernism, um, but how do these things coexist? How do they acknowledge one another? And what is the new future that is forged? Um, but I actually, I read about the show at the MFA, I didn't see it, and you're the first one to comment on the Calder hanging above, so I love that you noticed that and made that observation and shared it with all of us, because um, the irony of that is, is, <laughs> is poignant. I think we will leave it there. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Lee. Thank, Thank you, you, Molly. Thank Thanks, you, Molly. Molly. Thank you, Lee. Thank you.